step into the latest installment of our rebroadcast series, podcast number 62 titled, The Ominous Implications of the Ring of Fire, featuring Mike from COT on the End Generation Project. This episode originally aired on April 3, 2024, exclusively on counciloftime.com, see link in description. This episode delves into Bible study, highlighting eschatology amidst today's global challenges. Join Michael from Council of Time as we explore global perspectives in this riveting two-and-a-half-hour episode. With our commitment to disseminate God's holy word to every nation, experience daily insights from Michael from Council of Time, one of the most important Christian voices of our time, and who is known for his expertise in end-time prophecies, military intelligence, global weather patterns, and disaster readiness. To understand more, visit the Council of Time's only official website linked in description where we encourage everyone to go and experience. We're dedicated to providing truth, hope, and support to those struggling with addiction who simultaneously are seeking God's guidance. Your support drives our mission to guide individuals toward truth, sobriety, and preparedness for what is described in scripture as perilous times. Join our exclusive locals or Kofi community for breaking news and have early access to many special features. Thank you for being a vital part of the success of the End Generation Project. Before delving into today's rebroadcast podcast, The Ominous Implications of the Ring of Fire, Episode 62, let's recognize the remarkable growth of our channel in such a short time, reflecting the hunger among believers in these end generation times. It's truly a blessing to see our contributing content reaching audiences worldwide, with translations available in over 12 plus languages. As we journey together, we're committed to keeping this podcast ad-free, thanks to your subscriptions, your likes, and wonderful comments and messages. Join our vibrant communities on Locals and Kofi as we release the first installment of our merch line this week. All right, folks, now let's dive into today's podcast, shall we, titled The Ominous Implications of the Ring of Fire on End Generation Project Rebroadcast Podcast number 62 with Mike from COT. Blessings to all. God bless each of you. Let me get you guys uh, visible here. Small delay. Big delay, actually. Let's get it started. I'm going to bring up the, let me see if this master page works. If it does, we're in business. If not, back to the drawing board. Okay, we can see everybody. My prayers go out to those and affected by that uh, earthquake. But you guys knew things are, that's not the only one. Uh, I had to remind you guys, we did not make the 40 days in silence. That uh, that says it all. Of course. Now, I didn't look online or anything. So, I am just taking a uh, guess that people are saying, well, it was a weather weapon or something to that nature, right? That's what, uh, and that's what, uh, People normally go to, except to say, the earth is just getting started. We knew that, isn't it funny how that happened right after we did not make that 40 days? In fact, uh, right now, there's an expectation of some solar issues for Maltap, which that's going to reflect upon the earth, too. It'll really reflect upon the earth. Hmm. That probably won't be, uh, I would expect uh, more, you all. I would expect more, especially um, aftershocks, of course, are going to take place in Taiwan, right? Uh, due to that, that earthquake was actually a very revealing uh, component to a bigger problem in that area. And we have more on the way. As we continue, uh, things are going to degrade sporadically. And worse things will come. Right? In fact, it will work up to a point. Uh, earthquakes, the average earthquake is going to be around a 6.0. 
we're talking about multiple. You know how right now we have 4.5s, uh, 2.5s that are all over the place, right? Imagine if the world was just rocked with a outrageous number of earthquakes around a 6.0. That's also around the ring of fire. And unfortunately, with the ring of fire, the Coast Coast Plate is very disturbing. Very disturbing. Mexico is uh, Mexico, Peru, Haiti, those places are places to watch. They have the power to uncork the Coast Coast Plate. Should that happen, California, California is going to go through a very drastic time. Very drastic time. And that's uh, unfortunate. We're going to do a deeper look on earthquakes. We haven't done that in a while. So that uh, I would like to explain two layers of earthquakes, not, not the not forecasting or anything about the general nature of earthquakes, something you guys might want to know concerning crust of the earth again. The interior portions of the earth, anything you look at online is theorized. It's not factual. It's theorized. And they keep it that way, right? Right now, though, and due to, I'd like to cover some things in detail, but due to the eclipse, people have lost their minds over the eclipse. Everybody's going to show up for the eclipse. They're making this big thing of it. And it's, it's very difficult to say anything right now because it's going to get lost in the noise of what everybody else is saying about the eclipse and events surrounding the eclipse. So I have to somewhat wait until things begin to dissipate. Right? Somebody said, is it possible a vaporized antimatter? No. I, here, here's the deal. There were indications of earthquakes around Taiwan 10 days ago. 10 days ago, right? So... If it were a weapon, there would be no indications like that, right? It'd be everything would go from zero to uh, you know, zero to ten in a heartbeat. But there were too many indicators that something was uh, happening in that area. And with uh, activities on the sun, which jerked at the earth by way of gravity, right? Uh, well, when you have that earthquake, normally earthquakes have indicators at least 10 days in advance, right? And it's up to, once you start uh, to see that data long enough, uh, you can start to, do, to see exactly where it's going. So there are too many indicators, too many indicators. If there were no indicators, then yes, we'd be facing something different there. But when you have indicators like that, no. Plus, do you guys do understand that... Uh, when you explode a nuclear device in the ground, that's how you cause an earthquake, or you have a resonance generator, that's how you start a uh, earthquake, right? And, and they're pretty big. They're pretty big. You can't hear them. You cannot feel them. But the human ear, the human brain can't detect them. Everybody will start to complain of certain symptoms where they're being used, right? Uh, but nothing like that was used. And it's a known fact where China has uh, set certain things. But look at where Japan sits. Just look at Japan. Look at the entire system of, of Japan, Taiwan, all those islands. Those are, those places are fragile. They're in very fragile land masses, right? Fragile land masses. And they're going to have a, they're going to be lost one day. Japan won't be there one day. It's just not going to be there. Um, in fact, Tama Masib is going to swallow everything out there. It's just not going to be there. I think it's a sheer act of God's grace that they are uh, there right now. That's it. That's God's grace. But I'll tell you something. I do not attribute most of this activity to any type of weather weapons. I don't. Here's my problem with that. In the Bible, it states what we're going to have. It does. 
every time we have a major earthquake, people, they don't believe that the Lord is going to allow this to happen. If, if, what if you guys think about something? This earth, without management, would fall apart. It'd fall apart, right? Something is holding the earthquakes back. Something is stabilizing our magnetic field lines. Something is holding the solar activity back. Something is holding the atmospheres in place. The world has a view that these things just naturally are like that, right? No. Something is holding everything in order. Now, what do you think that is? As a Christian, I've always believed that's our Father's decree. That's why he has angels. Angels keep the forces or keep those decrees of the Most High. So, for example, if the, if, if the Lord said that, uh, you know, any, any object is to return back to its origin, I'm hinting at uh, gravitational forces, then it's an angel who induces those forces and keeps those forces. The work at CERN, if you start looking at the work at CERN, the tiniest forces are the strongest ones, and they don't understand how that works. Why is it that nothing can separate? Uh, two of the tiniest particles, right? Nothing can separate them except them. They don't understand what force is holding them together. There is no formula concerning mass because they're so tiny. It does not work. That's why quantitative, uh, the quantitative ideas came forward, right? Uh, they call that the spooky sciences. When the Father set the stars and he created everything, who do you think holds all that in, in order? Everything is obeying God except mankind. Everything is, right? But God promised something. One day, one day, one day, all these angels that hold these forces, that keep the constants, that allow us to walk around from day to day, all this stability we've been living in, one day it's going to be gone. It is already foretold that the angels will abandon their posts. They will not keep the heavens as they are now. They will not keep the atmospheres as they are now. They're not going to keep the forces as they are now. And then in that day, people, they're not going to be thinking about weather weapons. They won't. Just because humanity invents certain things and half of them did not work, right? It doesn't mean they use them. That's not what that means. Let me ask you guys something. You hear a lot of rumors about um, high-tech devices, correct? All of us have heard those about high-tech devices. All of us have. All of us have heard rumors about, you know, these, these uh, super advanced machines that have been invented a long time ago. Why is it? Why would anybody who was in control of the earth subject themselves to what some of these elites subject themselves to? Why would they do that? Why would they, too, undergo what the rest of us undergo? Hmm? Why would anybody, why would anybody who is like that even need money? Think about that. Why would they need money? If somebody were truly in power on this earth, they wouldn't need money, would they? They would manage money for everybody else, but they themselves would not need money, would they? So something is amiss here. This, something is incomplete with the story. Something is uh, not quite right. right. They're not quite right. It's, we can't attribute these problems that we're having, all these problems. We can attribute that to people in control because... If, if for every major thing that happens, if people believe that somebody else is doing it, where does that leave our father? What, he can't do anything? His angels can't do anything? They serve no purpose or something like that? You see the problem. As long as people give men credit 
what they're actually doing is saying that God's not doing anything. That's what they're doing. And if we believe that, we're going to believe the Father to be powerless. And if we believe him to be powerless, we're going to get, we're going to get frightened. Everything that happens on the earth, we're going to get scared. Oops, we're already there. And that is the problem. People get frightened when things happen in the earth. Why would a believer ever get frightened at anything that would happen in the earth if they believe in an almighty God? I know I believe in an almighty God. And there's no need for me to get frightened at anything that happens in the earth. I believe in the resolve of the Father and the power of the Father, the grace and the mercy of the Father. I do not empower everything else above the Lord and sit around like a scared chicken at everything that happens. I hate to say this, but of all the people in the earth, the Christians are frightened the most. They're frightened. They're frightened of financial collapses. They're frightened of weather. They're frightened of leadership. They're frightened of just about everything. Do they not know who their God is? Do they not know who their God is? They're frightened at home. They cling to things they shouldn't for protection. And in so doing, they, they subject themselves to all sorts of harm. Why? Because they're frightened. It just so happens. The same ones, right? All of us have done this to a degree. But every time we do something like that, we also believe that man has power over us in many areas of life. It's like being frightened of a creature. Big whoop de doo about a creature. Nothing can move nor breathe nor exist without the Lord allowing it to move, breathe, and exist. Why can't we believe that? Why do we believe that somehow God just set up a world like somebody would set up a house and then he left it? He didn't do that. Nothing can continue without God's express permission. It's just like physics, particle physics, right? Every, every, every particulate has a counter particulate. One cannot exist without the other. And if you destroy the counter particulate, the main particulate is destroyed. Everything has an opposite. Everything does. They're locked together. Do you not know existence is like that? Everything here on this earth, everything you can touch, feel, grab, see, smell, everything. God has to, moment to moment, allow it to be. Or it cannot be. He has to allow it to be. Nothing exists on its own. Nothing. God need not try to overpower anything. If right now if God wanted all evil gone, it would simply be gone. He didn't have to do anything. But simply withdrawn. And he'd be gone. If he wanted everything dark and everything evil to never exist, you wouldn't even remember anything dark and evil, and it will be gone. He's doing all this on purpose. I hope you know that. Everything here on this earth is on purpose. There have been no mistakes, none. We're going through a process, a necessary process. This process you're going through is necessary. Everything you encounter in your life is necessary. Not one thing is a mistake. Not one thing. God did not fall asleep because if he ever fell asleep, none of us would exist either. We cannot take the nature of God and put it into something we understand. That's impossible. Remember that. Remember that. And that way you're not frightened of all this stuff. You're not. That way you're not going to attribute all this stuff that happens on the earth to some nefarious thing. That's, that's very close to paranoia. Yesterday. How many had electronics that were messing up yesterday? Anybody have electronics that were messing up yesterday and the day before? Hmm? 
Somebody said, not sure about that, Mike. We all sinned. You didn't understand the nature of the question. Nothing can continue. Nothing exists without God's moment-to-moment express permission. God is highly aware of what we are. We're going through a process. Nothing is a mistake. A sin is not a mistake. A sin is premeditated. Nobody accidentally sins or it wouldn't be a sin. We're accountable for what we know of. You're not accountable for what you don't know of. If you ran over a rock going down the highway, one rock, your car hits one rock, that rock goes to the side. This rock hits the side of a mountain. On the side of a mountain, a truck passes and it catches on its bumper, puts the back windshield of another car out two hours later, and then it blows back to another car, causes an accident, and two people die. You didn't kill the two people. You didn't kill the two people because you had no idea the nature of that rock, right? You're accountable for what you know of, and sin is premeditated. Always premeditated. We know exactly what we're doing. We just sometimes play innocent, like we don't know what we're doing. We know exactly what we're doing and what we're choosing. Just as God told Israel, we have to learn to do good. God is highly aware of our sin. He knows of our sin. God knows of our stinking thinking. Is that what people call it? He knows about that. He knows about all of it. And he loves us anyway. He loves you regardless. You hear me? He loves you regardless. Regardless. Cyber hacking. Cyber hacking is... Uh, somebody says, I know my sins of addiction, but can't seem to get free. Well, first of all, listen, listen. Anybody who's addicted, stop saying you can't get free because you don't know tomorrow. Don't ever say that. Never say that. Do you hear me? Never say what you can't do. Get out of that habit. That's, part of, that's one of the major problems with humanity. God gave you a sense of what? Authority. And every time you say what you can't do, you're affirming darkness in your life. And you will have what you say. In the Bible it says, as a man thinketh, so is he. And if you continue to say that you can't get free of something, you won't be free of something. You won't. Remember that. If you want to be free, then stop saying you can't be free. You don't know the future. And when you say you can't be free of something, you're also saying God cannot deliver you. Because what you're doing is negating all deliverance for the future of your life. We should all know that God does not go against our will, does he? He does not go against our will. And when you say you can't do something, you're negating everything God could do. Hmm? That's what you're doing. So don't do it. How about that? Never do that. Start learn to change your speech so that you don't program yourself to be Charlie Brown. It is Charlie Brown who says, woe is me, doesn't he? That's what Charlie Brown does. Charlie Brown says he can't do anything right. Charlie Brown says he'll never be free. Charlie Brown says all the negative things. You guys are not Charlie Brown. That's a cartoon from a guy who went to jail. So don't, don't, you know, don't be that individual. Don't put limitations on yourself. Because just in case you have not noticed, you have had what you have declared. Think about it. Maybe you didn't put that together yet. Whatever you have declared, you've had. You have what you declare. Now, how many people declared? How many people have declared? How many people have declared that they, they can't do something? They're never going to be something, right? How many people have affirmed uh, they'll never get free of a situation? How many people have affirmed the darkness in their life, and then they wonder why they have that darkness, right? Because you keep affirming it. You keep calling it into being in your life. Every time you have a pity party, you're affirming darkness. Every time you're forecasting limitations of what you can't do, you're allowing, 
right? You're disallowing God to deliver you from it. You're saying, no, I don't want deliverance. I'll never be free. You start saying all these weird things. And guess what? You end up having exactly what, what you have declared. So you know what that means? That's a disconnect right here. People will say, oh, yes, I'm going to get a mansion about the big stuff. That's what they say. I'm going to get $10 million or something like that, right? But they, what they won't do is when they're going through their, their daily life, they continue to say, well, I can't do this. and I'll never be free of that. and I'll always mess this up. And it's always my fault. And this, that, and the other. That's what they do. Constantly speaking, repetitious declarations of darkness upon their lives. And the Father has already told us we're going to have those things that we proclaim in our lives. Hmm? God put you, he put you over your life. And you declare everything you're going to have. And what have you declared? Exactly. You are living the life you have declared. You may not want the turmoil in your life, but you have declared the turmoil. You may cry at the misery in your life, so stop, stop proclaiming the misery. Stop saying what you cannot be delivered from. Stop saying what you cannot have, what you cannot do. Stop saying those things. Because every time you do that, you affirm darkness. You're authorizing darkness in your life. God gave you authority. He put that in your mouth. Hmm? As a man thinketh, so is he. As a man thinketh, so is he. And you speak what? The abundance of your heart. When you start speaking like Charlie Brown, that's the abundance of your heart. That's your heart condition. When you do that, then you end up having what you say. I speak nothing when I'm in doubt about something. I speak nothing, nothing at all. I will not declare in my future that God will grant me. If he grants me tomorrow, right, there's no way I'm going to curse it today. So don't do that for your life either. Don't do that. Don't do it. Stop doing it. Take Charlie Brown and throw him out the window. Take him out of your mouth. Take that negativity out of your heart. This has nothing to do with positive energy, all right, or negative energy, right? I don't do that new age thing. I believe the word of God. As a man thinketh, so is he. You make proclamations in your own life, and it becomes the life you live because you declared it. You declared it to everything. You're the one that said you'll never be free. And so to this day, you're not free because you declared it. God does not go against your will. He doesn't push you around. That's why in the Bible, he constantly, he begs of you to turn to the light. He does not force anybody to turn to the light. Haven't you noticed that? God gave you the freedom of choice. One of the greatest powers in creation, choice. You can become what you choose to be. He does not interfere with that. He will always encourage goodness. He'll always do that, but he does not force you to become anything. Stop destroying your future by proclaiming Satan, king of kings, in your life for tomorrow. Don't do that. Because that's what happens when you sit there and say, I can't do this. I'll never be free of that. This will never happen for me. You're proclaiming darkness in your future. Charlie Brown is a poison to your mind. Hmm? In the worst days of my life, I've had the best blessings. That's why I don't believe in that energy junk. There were days when I was absolutely defeated on the inside. Never said a word, and the greatest breakthroughs took place in my life. Uh, take that, New Agers. I felt horrible, useless, defeated, and everything else, and miracles broke through my life. 
in those times. So forget about that positive energy stuff. I don't go for that. And I'll, I'll dare not mix that nonsense with the Holy Word. Are you kidding? I live by God's decrees. Not by this emotional state of the world that all of a sudden just popped up. I don't believe in that stuff. I believe in truth. And you know what the truth of your life is? What you are right now is the truth of your life. You have spoken many things into your tomorrows. You've got to change it. Change it for you. If you don't like what you're eating, right, from your plate, then go plant a different, go plant some uh, different harvest. Go have a different uh, uh, farm there. Quit putting dark, negative things in your farm. Plant some goodness in there. Plant some mercy in there. If you don't like eating defeat, stop planting defeat. Stop sowing defeat. If you don't like, how many don't like to be criticized? None of you do. Not one person likes to be criticized. You guys don't like criticism. You don't like people talking about you. It gives you a bad feeling when people get together and whisper about you. Right? Most Christians are paranoid of that. Guess what? then stop whispering about everybody else. Have no opinion about somebody else. If you don't believe reaping and sowing is real, I'll give you a challenge. Utter nothing about anybody else but yourself. You're going to do two things. When you stop talking about everybody else, you're going to find out what's in your friend. You're going to find out they have things in them that like to talk about other people. And they're not going to be satisfied until you sow a seed of judgment. And you have to, because they want you to reap that judgment in your life. Right? Stop talking about anybody else. Not the president. Not the ex-president. Nothing like that. Have nothing negative. Have nothing to come out of your mouth that has anything to do with anybody else unless you are blessing them. Unless you are blessing them. Don't even speak their name unless you're blessing them. Try that for a week and watch what happens. Watch what happens. The quality of your life is going to go straight up and through the meter. That's what will happen. It's going to go over the gate. And once you experience that, you'll start to learn something. It is darkness that has you have your conversation about somebody else. Listen, everybody else around you is going through that same process you are. Do you know that? Everybody else is struggling to get up that mountain. Some people, they're lower than you. Some people are higher than you. But everybody's struggling to get up that mountain. They're trying to find their way. When you cease your discussion about other people, listen, Christians, that means no one, not a soul, stop your discussions about everybody else. And I'm telling you, you're going to start to uncover. It's going to be little imps that come out of the dirt angry at you because you're not having a discussion about somebody else. Devils do that. Devils do that. And once you stop practicing, what darkness does, it uncovers itself. You're going to find that you have agents that are assigned to you. And their whole mission is to have you focus your anger, your ill will, whatever it is, on somebody else. So that you can do what God hates. God hates. He didn't just not like it. He hates it. Because it becomes an avenue for pure darkness. So then refrain from it. Have nothing to say about anybody. Not one soul. And watch what happens. Watch what happens. When you stop talking about other people, you're going to find that there are certain people in your life you can't even talk to at all. Because all they do is talk about other people. They never speak constructive things. You do that. For a whole week and you will not sow any seeds of judgment. You know what's going to happen? You will reap 
what you sowed. And because you didn't talk about them, you're going you're gonna to notice your quality of life will shift big time. It'll shift big time. Have it in your heart to bless a person, never curse them. Start with your worst enemy. Have it in your heart to bless that person. Listen, dig down deep. Remember that person is going through a struggle called life and they don't know how to make it through. Stop trying to be Jesus Christ in their life. Don't you be Jesus Christ in their life and you guide them to the Messiah if they allow you to. But you're not that one. Have an understanding of that. Start praying for them. Start interceding and praying. Not that they believe like you believe. No. Just simply say, Lord, please help them as you help me. That's all. Nothing more, nothing less. Just say, help them as you help me. Start trusting the judgment of the Lord in somebody else's life. Start trusting what the Lord will do in somebody else's life. Stop trying to be, we shouldn't, I'm not the physician for your life. Let me give you guys a quick example so you get this. I am not the physician in somebody's life. What I think may fix a person may hurt them even worse. So there, there will never come a day when I say, Lord, Lord, uh, please allow them to see this so that they can do that and then allow them to do this so that that can happen. I never pray like that. I trust the resolve of the Most High. And I'll say, Lord, remember them as you have remembered me. Lord, have grace and mercy on them. Lord, help their understanding. You guys will hear me say that a lot. Give them understanding, Lord. That's one of my major prayers is to give them understanding. See, because I know when God gives us understanding as to what's going on in our lives, we find peace. But I will never pray like I'm the doctor. I'm not going to pray, well, just, Lord, make this cut right here and then lift up that piece and grab this and throw that one out and, and free this person of that one and then sew that up and move this one up two inches. I'm not doing that stuff. No. God knows. He already knows what to do. He's going to do good to your neighbor anyway, with or without you. I just choose to side with the good work he already declared he's going to do for them, just as he did good work for you. You want to change in life? Change your harvest. Never sow bitterness. Everything you sow, you have to get back in this lifetime. Do you know what that means? If you had 20 days to live, you've got to reap everything you sowed. Every qualification has to be met. That mandate has to be met before you leave this world. I hope you know that. Everything you sow, you have to reap before you leave. Why do you think certain people get up to the, they get up to the end of their lives and they're screaming out in agony? Because they sowed discord. They sowed some things they shouldn't have sown. And God's word will never return void. You will reap what you have sown. Hmm? Don't live your life like that, right? Because in your heart, you want free. You want free. It's your ego and pride. It's my ego and pride. It's our ego and pride that causes us to think somehow we can lord over somebody else. It makes us believe that somehow we have the best answer for somebody else. We don't have the best answer for anybody. So long as we're still here on this earth, we have not made it. There are things undone. Days approach. You're going to need every good fruit your, your, your garden would yield. So good fruits, please. So some good seed. So any and everything you can and do so. Bind it in love that you may reap in love. What you sow is the truth of you. You cannot sow anything fake. If you act nice to a person... But you really don't like that person, you're not sowing anything but deceit. Hear me on that. If you don't like a person, and you go up and embrace a person, 
and have the show of niceness, you did not sow anything. You cannot sow a forgery. It must be a real seed. So if you're faking an emotion, you're not sowing anything. Anything but deceit. Do you guys understand? Your seed comes from within you. Your seed is the truth of you. The truth of you is what you sow. If you fake anything, you're not sowing a thing. If you have to hold your tongue, you're messing up already. If you have something bad to say about someone, and you just hold it back when they're around, you didn't sow any seeds of mercy, grace, or anything else. You did not. You're deceiving yourself. God works in within truth. I, I, I'll be the first to tell you he does not work within a lie. Coming up, having a career that was basically a lie, becoming people, becoming a person that people wanted me to be. I sowed many things in nothing but lies. And I'm telling you right now, you're not going to reap any good from a lie. If it's not within your heart, you have no ability to sow it. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? You're not sowing anything. You're deceiving yourselves. You can go through all the motions and fool everybody on the planet. You will not fool the Most High. You bite your tongue, you've done nothing. You purge yourself. Now you're moving. Now you're doing something. Hmm? Do you guys hear me? Somebody mentioned bitterness. Bitterness is what you agree to keep. Do you know that? That's all it. Bitterness is what you agree to keep. You want to get rid of bitterness? Stop agreeing with whatever that thing is, and you won't be bitter. Bitter is your agreement to keep something. So stop agreeing with it. Look at a person, right? Do listen. Do nothing in falsehood. You don't have to. You don't have to try and love someone. Stop doing that. Look at the other person. Have an understanding that person is a human being. Listen, that your father in heaven put here on earth, despite what you think they are. Your father in heaven has authorized them to walk in this day. Do you hear me? If they have life, they do not have life. On their own. Your father in heaven has given them life. Uh oh. And if he's given them life. His son died for them. Jesus of Nazareth. Died for them. And for you too. You telling me you would hate something that Jesus died for. Willingly. Is that what you're telling me? That you would hate something. That God the father. Sent his word to die for. You really would hate something God sent his word to die for. Is that what you're saying? Because when you look at another human being, start seeing the truth. Do not see that person based on what everybody else's lips have sown. Stop seeing people through the lens of language. Look upon them in truth. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter if they're black eyed, blue eyed. A black eye. What happens if you see a real black eyed person? Let me share this with you. Black eyed people will avoid you because something is in them. They get too close. God gave you authority over every devil on this earth. Stop being afraid of devils. God gave you authority over every devil on this earth. He gave you power over all the enemy, not some of the enemy. Anything that's truly possessed is going to dodge you as best they can. Unless they have something they have sown in you, they will dodge you. You see somebody like that, that means they are captured. Do you not know that you have authorization to eject that thing out of that person, to free that person? Now, before you get Ramboy, anybody that you free like that, the Lord will have a support system set up for that person. Did you know that? He'll never have you free someone and then cut that person loose. Just so you know that. That will never happen. 
Do you know why? When a spirit's ejected from a person, it's going to go out and find nothing but dry places. It's going to come back to that vessel it left. And if that house is swept clean, meaning that person has no belief that they have nothing that they're serving at that moment, it's going to go out and find seven worse than it is, and that person's in condition is going to be worse than the first. So to, so to eject a demon from a person, to have that person not receive Christ is a death sentence to that person. God's not going to send you to do that. He's going to set up a support system for that person. And then he'll send someone to eject that demonic entity. He'll never have you eject a demon and then cut that person loose. doesn't work that way. There is a principle about these demonic entities. A house swept clean as a person with no belief. Why do you think you had your experience when you didn't believe a thing? Every single last one of you who had your extraordinary experiences, it came at a time when you had zip belief. You weren't really believing in spiritual things. You were embedded in the earth. You were a normal person, and you had that supernatural experience. Why? Because you were swept clean. It does not mean you rejected Christ. It means you were not filled with Christ. You were swept clean. You were living a normal life. And that's when you had your supernatural experience. You know, that happens all over the world. And people wonder, well, I wonder why that happened at that time. Well, that's why. Because you were swept clean. These demonic entities hunt, search, and they hunt for places that are swept clean. And if they can get in, they get in. Every soul on this earth is introduced into the spiritual realm. Every soul, nobody's missed. That is a mandate. Many don't understand it, but that is a mandate. My, my. Have good seeds sown in your garden. It's almost time for a major reaping. A real one. A real weeping. Remember. Remember. Your Lord and Savior. Your Lord and Savior, Jesus of Nazareth. It's very real. And he came just for you. We do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Don't put yourselves on that roller coaster, that never-ending roller coaster, where you always see doom at the end. Don't do that. If you want out of that, start sowing seeds based on your father's principles, not based on psychology, based on your father's principles your Father in Heaven, His principles. And you will reap what you have sown. In my life, I'm not really, you, you know what, guys, I pray for a lot of people. I do. I do. But I never let anything external from me alter me. In other words, any of you can never make me bitter against somebody else. That's a trick of darkness I saw a long time ago. For example, if you have a bad day, right, and then you start treating others in a negative way because you had a bad day, that's a trick. That's a trick. It's a very deceitful trick. Do you know that many people fall for that? Then they get into a lifestyle of doing that. Hmm? Mm. And for the last, well, I'm going to take a break, but guess what? You know what that means? Do you guys know what that means? If somebody, even the Bible, even other people are telling you to, to you get to really watch what you're sowing. Do you not understand the power you have right in your hands? Instead of cursing your tomorrow, 
right? Instead of cursing it, refrain from tomorrow, period. Listen, refrain from it. Refrain. That means don't sit around trying to speak everything in your tomorrow. Have this understanding. Tomorrow is promised to no man. So if tomorrow is promised to no man, you can't speak anything into your tomorrow because it's not yours until God gives it to you. Correct? If tomorrow is promised to none of us, how can you then speak anything into a tomorrow that's not yours? You can't. So that means you don't go around, well, tomorrow I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and, and bless this and bless that. Don't do that either. Speak nothing about tomorrow. Nothing. When the day comes, have an understanding. God is giving you dominion over that day, and it's up to you. It's up to you. It's up to you to utilize yourself in a holy fashion or not in that day. If you're mindful of it, right, you'll employ it. Never wake up cursing everything. Time for you to, you, you ought to wake up. You, you try this, wake up. The first thing, try to realize the Lord has given you another opportunity. Then go over everything you messed up the day prior. And do a little better the day God gave you. That's it. You can't do everything in one day. So do what you can do in the day. Never put weights all over your shoulders. Don't do that. Do what you can do. Hmm? Do what you can do. That's what you do. That way you won't be frightened. Soon people will start running to and fro. They will. They will. People have a hunger for something new. They're going to get something new, all right. You know how people are gravitating toward this eclipse, right? The eclipse. Why would people gravitate towards the eclipse? It's because people have have said a lot about this eclipse. It has sparked major curiosity within people, right? You know, they're shutting schools down. A lot of people are shutting schools down that day. Hazmat teams have been called up from all over the place. National Guard forces have been called up from all over the place. Police, police are told that you know that's going to be one of their, uh, one of their long-term employment days. The people can't see what's happening. They're still going to gather. There's no way in the world I would go to a gathering that day. I would not do that. That's why the hacking is so high right now. There's too much chatter of these mass shootings. You know, I pray that does not happen, but uh, the Lord consistently tells us the degradation of mankind as we go through the word of God. What they eventually, what level they eventually go down to. The animalistic, dark worship behavior of humanity is coming to the forefront. People are hostile. Remember Hamas in Israel, how Hamas went into Israel. Got children, parents and grandparents. Remember that? Israel did not go and do that to Hamas. Hamas did that to Israel. Do you know Hamas promises to do the same thing here in the USA? Or you didn't hear that one, did you? The same thing that happened in Israel they promise will happen in the USA. That's very disturbing. It's disturbing because people are not going to pay attention to it. Before Hamas went into Israel, do you know five days prior to that, they had warning of it. They weren't listening. You know what they kept saying? Nobody can catch us off guard like that. That's what they kept saying. Nobody can catch us off guard like that. That's what they kept saying. They said that in Israel five days before Hamas went in there. 
and what happened. You see, arrogance, the Lord warns us about arrogance. Pride, thinking we know it all. We do not know it all. We don't. We're experts at deceit. That's what we are. As far as goodness and holiness, that requires Christ to depart those ways to us. He has to teach us. But we're very prideful and dismissive. People are talking about gap making these gatherings during the eclipse. Suppose something terrible happens during the eclipse. I don't even want to talk about it much because if I did and it actually happened, I'm going to be given testimony somewhere. That almost happened before. I've learned to keep my trap shut on a few subjects. People are prideful in areas they're not thinking about the consequences of anything. I mean, they were, you know, a month ago, but not now. Not now. The Air Force is not going to release biological chemicals over people that day. Sorry, they won't do it. But, but again, listen, listen, uh, I know you guys are going to hear quite a bit, right? Here, here's my deal. Here's what I normally do. In a big event like this, I, I go off into a corner. I don't speak much on it. The reason why is because people start coming forward with every idea they can find to get to, you know, to get views and everything else, right? If anybody speaks sober uh, during that time, nobody wants to hear some boring narrative about some major event. Right? So I have to wait until the smoke clears. Go into my corner. Right? Be very silent until the smoke clears. And then I'll say something about it. Right? But I can't say too much because it'll get lost in the noise. It's kind of like this 40-day thing. Do you know this 40-day thing turned into a thousand different things on the Internet? I, I, today, somebody's, people have been keeping track at the rumor mill concerning the 40 days, right? And somebody actually wrote back, now this is coming back all over the place. They said, well, Mike said that King Nebuchadnezzar was going to emerge from the sun at the end of the 40 days. And that makes no sense, but it was out there, right? So when things like that hit the grapevine, they gain momentum all by themselves. And then truth is often distorted. People have to make it a little more exciting. So they add this to it and add that to it before you know it. It's something totally different, right? With this eclipse, um, is there meaning to it? Yes. Would it do me any good to tell anybody or, or to discuss what I think the meaning is? No. You'll get lost with everybody else's statements. And so I have to wait until the smoke clears to actually talk about it. The only caution I have about this eclipse is the close proximity of people in these large groups. It's not very wise in these large groups. Right? There's one thing I always have a concern about. It is this, and I mean, it's an, this is an actual operation. A person contaminates themselves with a very toxic agent. The person does. The person will have 72 hours to walk around normally without dying, but they will die. The end, end result is a death sentence. This person goes around large crowds. They look just like you and I, so nobody will suspect that they're spreading an agent all over the place. Right? My, one of my greatest cautions, after finding out about the reality of that type of operation, is that on a very unfortunate day, there are going to be a group of infected individuals who have been injected with some, a concoction of some very bad things. They're going to look normal. They won't sweat. They're going to interact and do everything else. They're going to talk to and join with as many people as possible and spread it to everybody who's in proximity with them. I know that's going to happen one day. I just don't know exactly when that's going to happen, but I know it's going to happen one day.
to date, I believe they have they have uh, has to be over a couple dozen interruptions. I'll say of people who tried that very thing, and the end result of them is death. They will die. See, there are things out there. There is no cure, no vaccine against. 72-hour incubation period, followed by a horrible death, which means the person will show no symptoms, none, but they'll spread it everywhere. That will be a mass casualty event, when within three days, 500,000 die from some sort of toxin. And something like that will more than likely happen. That's going to happen right here in the USA in multiple cities. That's my concern. Profiling won't work against a person like that, right? You... Because you're talking about Americans, do you not know? Do you, you guys do know what's happening right now, don't you? Do you know what's happening right now? Let me let me share with you guys what's happening right now. And then I'll take a break. We all know racism is in the USA. What you may not know is a is a is a, a weird battle that's taking place. Listen, Republicans and white supremacists have clashed. Yes, I said Republicans. Republicans who have no affiliation with any white supremacist groups are in a type of war with white supremacists who feel they have been absolutely ostracized. So this is really going to spiral out of control. And I hope you guys know that. Really hope you guys know that. First of all, it that sounds confusing in people's ears, doesn't it? Nevertheless, it's beginning. It's about to turn very vicious. Very vicious. Now, we're not talking about some of your prestige people. No. We're talking about the folks who follow these groups. Some are white supremacists against Republicans and Republicans against white supremacists. We all know within every group, you have some that represent different things. But it's already beginning. And it's very nasty at its onset. It is very nasty. What has truly happened is you have people who still have morals. They've gotten tired. They have become quite twat tired of certain tactics. And when you try to root something out, it causes problems. I hope that you can hear me on this. This is going to touch many people. The wrong way. But they're trying to pop them, get them out. They're pushing them out. And it's going to turn into a real mess because nobody has ever heard of that before. See how all your comments stopped? The implications. Well, it's going to be quite bitter. But it's happening. It's happening. I know it's going to draw people into it too. Get ready for the days when people do not care what you think about them. Because when these days are fully manifest, each person will demonstrate what they really are. Nobody will hide behind kindness. Nobody's going to bite their tongue. Nobody is going to put up a false sense of being somebody else. Everybody will be who they are. And in that day, it's going to be painful. 
very bitter. The Lord warned about that time. While everybody else is looking for these external issues, God warned us about humanity itself. When people become what they truly are and they're not ashamed to hide what they have been, that's when the true dark days will be here. And those days are approaching fast. Fast. So humanity has challenges. They no one it. knows that day nor the hour. So we know the season be that was coming because right he died on the cross. Do you not know the process began time began when up. he died on Honesty the cross? Time. Hopefully everybody here is mature. The process is not going to begin. It began Hopefully when he, he died. Mature. we got to get something out of the way. Don't ask me why. I moved in this direction. I am. Honesty time coming up. Folks. Hear me on the how many of you guys like sports? Type of one if you like sports. I like certain sports, I do. I know the history of sports, but I like certain sports. How many of you guys like sports? How many of you guys like those who don't like sports? How many have a favorite activity? Or how many of you have been on some type of team? Have you ever been on a team? Part of a group? Okay, that's better. So if you've been part of a group or been on some type team, right? And when you're on a team or in a group, it becomes competitive, right? How many of you have children? How many of you would pick your children over somebody else's children? You can go ahead and tell the truth. Hopefully, we see a one everywhere. Right? Everywhere. So what I'm saying is this. You've been a part of something where you actually looked with sincere eyes at your team or group or whatever it was, and you favored it over everybody else. Right? It could have been a bowling team. It could have been uh, your class. It could have been just about anything, but you favored it over everything else. And when it came down to it, right, you'd pick it over everything else. Now, for all of those of which none of those categories fit, you're still alive right now for a reason. It's because you picked yourself. You did. You saved yourself. You tried to. Right? You favored yourself. A lot of us got ourselves in trouble favoring ourselves over everybody else. Right? We did. Come on now. This is uh, truth time. Let's look at this with mature eyes. Right? No side skirting out of this one. Right? When you were driving down the road, right? Almost about to hit a car, you saved your own car. Some people it worked, some it didn't. Right? When you were a small child and you saw that bee nest, you may not have run straight into it. Right? When you were laughing and in, on, on some snow or something like that, you may have saved yourself from falling and laughed at somebody else. So we know what favor is. Everybody here knows what favor is. Security. Now we're going to talk about security real quick. Security. When you're in a conversation with strangers, it's very difficult to conversate, isn't it? Very difficult to conversate. When you're in a group, right, all of you in these chat rooms, you've been in other groups you didn't feel welcomed in. Anybody ever do that? You, didn't, you just didn't feel welcomed in chat rooms. Certain chat rooms you can't go to. You're like, ooh, I can't stay there. I agree with no one here, right? You ever get like that? Didn't agree with anybody. You felt like you were an outcast. You felt like you were not among your own, right? And, and for the most part, here in COT, a lot of people have found comfort in a lot of people here in COT, right? Sometimes you don't have a lot of comfort, but you have some sort of comfort. Hopefully that's the idea, right? Where everybody can be comfortable. So when it comes to chat rooms, 
you would go to another chat room to find out info or interact or something like that. But then to hang out there over and over again, you may not be able to do it. Right? So you have a, you favored a group over another group. Okay? You see how that works. So that means all of us, to a degree, we know what it is to favor one group over another. Right? We know what that is. And we know that when it came down to it with a group, most often, you would, you would to favor one group over another means you're going to have a, a sense of loyalty to one group over another. Right? In the world, there are different races in the world. All of us are on different races. When trouble begins, I've noticed something all throughout my life. When troubles start, when people are among all sorts of people, when real trouble begins, people will find their groups fast, and they don't play. Listen to me. They'll find the group, the people they're most comfortable with. That's what they'll go and find in trouble, which means you can be around a bunch of strangers. You can be around a brand new group, right? But you're always going to find a group within a group that you feel really comfortable with. Always. Always. This always happens. I used to notice this in combat all the time. People would go to combat. You know, you go as divisions or battalions, whatever you want to send. But then when the combat broke out, people would begin to segregate into specific groups all the time, automatically, because they felt comfortable with certain people, but other people they did not feel comfortable with, right? So everybody goes back to their base group when trouble starts. They go back to the base group. They favor that base group. And in that base group, when the base group makes a decision, it's very hard for any one individual to decide against that base group, especially in a time of trouble, because you're in survival mode, right? You're, you're in somewhat of a survival mode. And so you're forced to choose a group over another group, whatever the case may be. This happens in a time of crisis. At a time of crisis, people feel most comfortable with a specific group in a crisis. As the world continues, as it's doing, we are hitting this crisis period, right? And we're really about to go into an unknown crisis period. Every single last one of you who are alive today, you're about to enter into an unknown crisis period. In this unknown crisis period, don't think it's strange when people go back to their base groups because they feel comfortable with their base groups. Right? Don't think that to be strange. This is going to happen all over the world. Then you will see the true loyalty of an individual. Now, in humanity's case, you, you're not going to want to be around those of you who believe in Christ. You're not going to be around those. You're not going to want to be around anybody who believes, who, who believes in any other deity. You're not. You're just not going to do it. And when it comes down to what we're about to go through, right? People are going to resort back to those groups that they share their base faith with. Whatever that base faith is, you're going to want to be around those groups due to the nature of the issues we're facing. Due to the nature. Once people go back to that group, they will defend that group. They're going to be with that group, operate with that group, and defend that group. Okay? They will. They will defend that group. Now, society reinforces this. This is what you may not know. Society reinforces the fact that everybody should be loyal to their group. There are architects to the world. These architects, they're the same ones that control education. They're the same ones that give mandates to these reporting agencies. They're all the same people, the same ones who pay for sports. You may ask what the sports have to do with the news, everything. 
everything. Sports has everything to do with the news. Don't you know? Sports is the reinforcement of the ideology you hold close to your hearts that will kick in in any time of crisis. During a time of crisis, they already know what's going to happen. And it's about to happen. They already know what's going to happen during a time of crisis. They just ensure that everybody is programmed enough where the response can be predicted. And to date, all responses have never failed to be exactly what they wanted them to be. Let me give you a small example of that, right? Just in case you doubt that. Just in case you doubt that. When people go to a game, we're talking about majority of people. I would say I'm a bit different. I'm a bit different. Because I'm truly, and I'm a bit different. I can't tell you how, not right now, because somebody may lead, you know, latch on to it and say, me too. Yeah, I don't want you to say me too. I'm a bit different. But in sports, in sports, advertisement for sports and all this money they put out for sports causes people to go and support sports, Correct. A lot of people pay a lot of money for sports, and they support it. They know this because they keep it going. They know the money flow that goes through there, paying these athletes an outrageous amount of money to go and be loyal to their team members. They even have the people fight for their specific team. Believe it or not, believe it or not, this is a psychological ploy to embed a deep, deep, deep sense of loyalty within you and predictive behavior. Right? You will fight for your team. In other words, that group that you gravitate towards in a time of crisis, the activities that you convey or, or whatever responses you convey during a time of crisis for that particular group has been pre-programmed since you were a child. It's something everybody does, right? A funeral. Remember the first funeral you went to? Of the person you did not know. The first funeral you went to of the person you did not know. You go to that funeral and you did not know whether to cry or not. You had no real attachment. Do you remember that? Some of you may not, but some of you do. You had no real attachment to the person. And so you looked at everybody else and you started feeling awkward because you didn't know whether to cry or not. The crowd wins out. Right? The crowd wins out. Now, most often, we emulate what we see around us. Most often. We have the same behaviors everybody else has because we want to fit in. Nobody wants to be the one standing out. Nobody wants to be the one that everybody points at. Right? Especially Christians. A Christian does not want to be the one that's ever singled out. Do you know why? There's a reason you came to Christ. You have memories of times that you were singled out. You do. You have hurtful memories of times that you were singled out. It's in your past. Well, guess what? The architects know this. They know that. They utilize it to their advantage. And they will utilize it to their advantage. They also know that we emulate. That we emulate things that we believe we're going to be accepted by. It's like right and wrong, right? And, and when you're talking about different things, do we ever speak anything original? Do we? No, we simply utter what somebody else said. We lock on to somebody else's idea. We speak their ideas. We don't really speak anything original. We don't. We really don't. Most of what we speak, we got from somebody else. Right? Most people have a personality trait called absorption. They have an absorption personality trait, which means they will absorb everything from everybody else and utilize it as though it's their own. They'll do that a lot. That's absorption. Right? Now you have certain people. There are some people who don't have that. I, I don't have absorption. So don't really repeat what everybody else says. That's why I stay in trouble so much. But a lot of people do. They will echo what somebody else says. They'll use it as their own. It's kind of like dressing yourself, right? People say, well, you know, I dress original. No, you don't. You don't. You got that from somebody else. Even a person says, nope, what I wear is totally unique. No, it is not because somebody else made your clothes. 
Well, I made my own clothes, yeah, but you cut the pattern just like every other shirt out there. Just like all the other pants out there, like all the other dresses out there still fits in that category. So we emulate just about everything. What we don't realize is that on a very deep level, we have emulated things to the point where we act just like a flock of birds. And the architects know that. They're going to utilize that. Even our defenses are pre-programmed. Your responses that you mount up as a defense is pre-programmed. That's why Jesus said, don't think of what you're going to say. Right? The Holy Spirit will give you what to say in the same hour you need to say it. Otherwise, because if you think of what you're going to say, all you're going to do is draw upon everything everybody else said. You're going to repeat somebody else's behavior. Emulation, ladies and gentlemen, right? Emulation and predictive movements is how the architects see everybody else. They know how you're going to respond. So if you know how people are going to respond, right? If you ever needed something from the masses, you would then issue or design something where they could respond in a very specific way. What you're about to see from civilian to civilian in the fight they're about to have is very predictive. Very predictive. It's why they have kept the story of racism alive in certain states, and in other states they kill it. I won't go in deep on that. But here it is. When it comes to races, if anything ever broke out in the USA, right? in the USA, people are going to scramble back to those they feel most comfortable with. When everything else breaks down, they're going to go back to those they feel most comfortable with. The architects will then utilize that for their own purposes. And you're absolutely about to undergo that. Everything will be sped up as far as what they have to do. Everything will be. And you're right in the middle of it. And they're depending on everybody to respond as they usually respond. To go back to that base of loyalty. Of the many times they have done this, everybody went back to their loyalty group. They've already done this several times. In the last 15 years, they've already achieved this several times. And people did exactly Exactly. They went right back to their loyalty base, to what they were most comfortable with. They did this several times. And it never failed. Never. Never, ever failed. If you take note, those who don't follow that plan, right? Those who don't follow that plan, they got pushed on the outskirts of everything. It was only a few. What a lot. Right? I'm telling you this because I know the crises that are coming. But before the real crisis, you're going to need another crisis. I'm telling you before it ever hits. So that when you're stuck out there in those groups, you can think about this. We need a crisis before a crisis. Before a real crisis ever comes. And we talk about revelation a lot, don't we? We talk about, you know, binary systems a lot. We do. The, the bad news, I guess, would be a real crisis is coming. A real one. I mean a real one. One that we've never gone through. No one has ever gone through a crisis like what's coming. No one. The only words I can use for that crisis is absolutely devastating. They cannot afford for the world to be at full strength when that crisis comes. So they need another crisis. They need something that's going to mentally wear you out. You know what the Bible it says? That the dragon prevailed against the saints. Right? He'll wear out the saints of the Most High. Something like that. And in fact, something akin to that. 
in a very deep sense. So before the major crisis comes, they need you exhausted. For those who follow, it's going to work. For those who follow other folks, it's going to work. If you're a follower, it's going to work. You know what a follower is? A follower is somebody who does not trust themselves. And so what they do is they put themselves into somebody else's hands, never taking responsibility for their own movements, never initiating anything, right? So they just follow somebody else. Not everybody has made a leader in the world. Not everybody. But it's going to wear the followers out. Because they will select your leaders. They will. They're going to select your leaders. How are they going to do this? How would they select a leader for a Christian community? Because they're going to dictate who survives and who does not. What do you mean? Well, here we go. You know, there are lots of people out there doing weird things, right? All they have to do is say, well, you know, this people did, this person did this weird thing because of that ministry. Because of that ministry. See where I'm going with this? So already weird things happening out there. All they have to do is make a connection. That's enough to hold a person for questioning and crush their entire organization. You know how that works, guys. So they will select who's going to lead you. They do not need strong people leading you. They need people who think in a very specific pattern. They need people who believe in the worldly system. Folks, I hope you're hearing me. They need people to lead you who believe in the worldly system, not the godly system. They can't have anybody who believes in the godly system. They need folks who believe in the ways of the world, who have the audacity to carry the word of God while they follow the ways of the world. That's what they need. They need folks who will speak up for the ways of the world. They do not need anybody who would dare say, don't follow the world. They need folks who will advocate for the world, yet still hold the word of God and make the connection. That's who they're going to pay. That's who they're going to assure succeeds. And the rest of the people have to go. So then the people following them will merge that Christian group and with these other groups for a full compromise. I mean a full compromise. Causing a Christian to be stress-free. So a person can live with their sin and have no conviction about it. They need that before the crisis comes. They're working on that now. And they're succeeding big time. Big time. That means, listen, there are a lot of people out there in the world who don't necessarily want to hear the word of God. They love the Lord. They just don't love the same Lord you do. What they love is different. They're being embedded in many different places because this crisis before the crisis, right? It must work, and it will be achieved. It will be. So what that means is a lot of you are going to have upsets because you're the people, whatever people you listen to concerning faith, they're going to be removed. And what will be left are those who advocate for the world. You're going to notice that more and more. They're being squeezed now. Did you guys know that, of, of, let's take the Internet, for example, there are lots of people who have been removed already. Do you know that? They've been removed. Many have been notified. They have been. Many have been given uh, certain documents, right? instructions, if you would, of assurances. Many have already. And all of it's a guise to get you to think in a certain specific pattern. They're going to water you down. You must be weak when the main crisis comes. 
Will they achieve it? According to the word of God, they will. They will not fail. That's according to the word of God. You know all those people in Revelation who stood on that sea of glass? Hmm? They came out of great tribulation. They were no longer on the earth. So who's left on the earth? Who are the real people left on the earth at that time, according to the book of Revelation? We saw who they were. A lot of people don't want to admit it, but we saw who they were. But let's back up from there. So we know the righteous, right, are going to come out of great tribulation. The only way to come out of great tribulation is by way of transition. That means your life ended here on this earth. That's what it means. Your life either ended or you were directly translated one way or the other. Maybe that's why in Revelation it says men will seek death but will not find it. Men will desire to die but death will flee from them. Maybe that's why. Hmm? Maybe that's why. So, so, before the crisis comes in, it is a crisis. Nobody, we, n n nobody has been through this crisis before. And there's no easy way to speak about the major crisis that's coming, right? It will unfold and overtake everything. It will. There's not one place on this earth it will not impact greatly. There's no escape from it either. But you are certainly in the way because of your core belief. See, in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it states that Christ, if you're in Christ, he's in you. Well, if Christ is in you, that means by way of you, he's in the earth. And by their own admission, you contaminate everything around you with righteousness. You limit the work of their Lord. You know, the one they pay homage to. They're not going to, listen, they're not going to, they're not going to pull any punches. They're not going to hide it for too long. These guys openly make declarations to all the ancient gods. You know that, right? Apollo has more names in the earth. They use different names in the earth for Apollo. They're an open worship to Apollo. They are. They are. They know certain things they have found in mountainsides and what they have taken out of caves and communications they have received from this and other and what really lives on the earth. They know what the real deal is. They know what the real deal is. They know of the hedge that keeps things from eating you. They know about that hedge. They know that the ancient world, they know where it is. Not when it is. Sure, it existed a long time ago, but they know exactly where it is. And you're going to know, too. And when it's made real to you, it's going to scare you. Whether you're rooted or not, it's going to scare you. But you don't have to stay in that fear. I'll make that bold statement again. Whether you believe in Christ or not, it's going to scare you. But you do not have to operate in that fear. Things will scare you, right? But you don't have to live your life or make a move based on fear. God didn't give us a spirit of fear, so we don't operate, nor do we live by that spirit of fear. That means you're going to be startled at things, yes. Certain things will frighten you, yes. But you don't have to continue to live your life in it. Listen to me. Many will compromise because of the fear they behold. In other words, because of loyalty, many are going to switch sides right in front of your faces. Parents, that means you may have a child who you thought believed in the Lord. When the fear level rises, they're going to switch sides. You become an obstructor, somebody who's in the way. And they will turn you in. They will tell on you. We have social media. It's nothing for a child to say, you know, my, my dad is always talking about Christ and how wrong the world is and this and the other. They're turning you in. 
or you, you know how they want everybody to have a new iPhone, right? Does this make sense? Hey, come and get this. Come and sign up with us. Turn in your old iPhone, and we'll give you an iPad. We're going to give you a watch. We're going to give you a phone free of charge. That makes no sense, does it? Why is the government ensuring that everybody has a cell phone, that everybody has an up-to-date cell phone with AI and GPS and all the bells and whistles? Even the government phones have all those bells and whistles. Why? Because they want to know where everybody is at all times. They cannot mark you. Satan cannot mark you. Just so you know that. He can't mark you. You have to mark yourself. Humanity has to do it themselves. Satan cannot do it. If Satan can do it himself, there'd be no need for him to build the beast system in the earth. He would just manifest and start taking over, but he can't do that. Which is why the first beast looks just like the dragon. And the dragon possessed the first beast. Didn't he? No, they want your whereabouts. Did we discuss this uh, the other day that the Air Force runs the GPS satellites? The Air Force does. All of them, even for the enemy. You do know that the Air Force runs a GPS system for the whole world. Do you guys know that? The whole world utilizes the U.S. Air Force's GPS systems. You do know that. That means... All the missiles that Russia would fire that need guidance that utilize GPS, they're using our GPS satellites for their missiles that would kill us. Just so you know that. That's the U.S. Air Force, right? Oh, and it's coming quickly. So it's the U.S. that knows where everybody is. Where's the United Nations? It's in the USA. Mm -hmm. They need to know where everybody is. They need absolute accountability. Now, hear me close on this. If you haven't noticed, did you notice in the Bible that Satan didn't, he, he didn't kill anybody himself. He had people kill people. He's the one that turns, right? A nation against a nation. He has people kill people in your life. Spirits can't up and kill you. People are your problem. The greatest fear of a Christian is another person. That's the greatest fear of a Christian. They're never threatened by those other things and potentials. They're always threatened by people. Aren't they? If you think back in your life, especially ladies, your greatest fear is people. Your nightmares of people. Oh, boy. Duped and duped big. The Lord told us the enemy is of your own household. Who guides the world in Christianity? Who? The Lord said your enemy is of your own household. If we were to operate by the Lord's word then the true enemy of us is not some other country. Oops, it's not in some other country, is it? It's happening from within. Hmm. The enemy is of your own household. And a consolidation is about to begin. The crisis before the main crisis. It must begin. It must take its toll. As a Christian, you have to be ready for the truth. That's why I took you on that journey at the beginning of this, after the break, in this conversation about groups and about your favorite team and about this. It is to cut through our own facades, to get right at the core, because see, we're in a natural state of partial denial. Now, n none of us wants to admit to something that would lead to some other dark thing. None of us does. We're trying to get away from that. And in so doing, 
we start to deny the very nature of ourselves. It's important for us to remember our own weaknesses and what we'll really do so we can challenge them. Because if you don't know about them, if you deny them, you're going to have to uphold that denial. And in so doing, you're going to find yourself a part of a group. You don't want to be a, you don't want to be a part of that. Okay? The race war they've been trying to start for so long, it has begun in a different way, so different that all those people who said it's not going to work against me, they're actually advocating for it right now. People are playing their roles, and they cannot see it. For the life of them, they can't see it. There are blinders on people right now. They cannot see what they're doing. In fact, if people knew the whole story for themselves, there are certain things they wouldn't do anymore, period. There are certain things they would not do anymore. I can tell you this. I can tell you this. There is a distinction between holiness and unholiness, and it is the kingdom of God in the world. No exception. No exception. There's no exception. It's up to you to find it and not be a part of the very thing you hate. Because if you don't find it, then you're fully employed by the architects of hatred. Hmm? Satan, with Satan, his tactics are never to have himself identified. Listen, in every single case, in every single episode in the Bible and otherwise, the fight was over before people realized it started. Did you notice that? While people thought they were, something was coming, they were already in the battle. They were already destroying other people by the time it was over. When the people thought it was actually coming, that was when it was over. The casualties were already there. People had already killed people. They never realized what they had been a part of until after they looked back on it and then they could see it. And so what I'm telling you is that it's impossible to see it Right now, you're right in the middle of it. Of course, this time, everybody's going to see it, and I'm telling you that people won't care. But right now, you're in the middle of something. And people are causing carnage left and right. They're killing people left and right, and they don't even know it. Because so long as the person says, it's not me, I'm not doing that, right? Then they really do believe that they're not part of the group that's killing somebody else. And what I'm telling you is that it's already begun. The murders have begun. And the blood is already flowing. In a confusing battlefield, the troops engaged in the battle, it's very difficult for them to see what's happening. So they always have somebody on the outside who can see the whole battle to tell them where they are, to tell them what's around the corner, what's happening. Because in the fog of war, it's so difficult to tell who is who and what's actually happening. You have to have guidance from outside of that war. If you don't have guidance or optics outside that war, that's when people die from what's called friendly fire. That's when you start shooting your own people. You kill your own people. The fog of war gets that thick that you don't know that you're killing your friends. So the only way to tell that is to have someone see it from the outside. You cannot get direction from inside you have to get direction from outside you cannot get direction from inside you have to get direction from outside what have you noticed lately what have you noticed lately you've noticed that all direction is coming from the inside 
That's what you've noticed. Everything around you is about to fall apart. And of all, every, it seems like all the direction is coming from the inside. I'm telling you right now, there, there is hardly anybody on the outside that the people on the inside would hear. The people on the inside will not hear anybody on the outside. And those are the very voices they need to hear right now. That means people are believing the rhetoric from the inside. That's how you kill your brother. That's how you become Cain. That's where the jealousy comes from. That's where the strife comes from. That's where everything is coming from the inside because it's the fog of war. Who is that voice on the outside? Those who have walked away from the world itself. Those who are not caught up in anything of the world. Listen, those who are not caught up in anything of the world. If anybody is caught up or part of anything in this world, they can't give you guidance. Not the guidance you're looking for. So what does the Lord do? What does the Lord do? He does what he always does. What did he do to Jeremiah? What did he do? What was Jeremiah doing before he was called? Anybody remember? Anybody? Anybody remember? He was kind of on the outside. Wasn't he? And then he was taken totally outside of what everybody else was in, wasn't he? He was taken, and he was put on the outside. That's how God prepares people. In other words, a person prepared by the living God to speak to those who are on the inside never, ever takes up for anything that's happening within the kingdom. Elijah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they did not take up for anybody in those kingdoms. Did you notice that? They did not. They didn't take up for anybody in those kingdoms, did they? No, they didn't. They did not. They didn't take up for anybody in those kingdoms. They didn't justify anything of anything that was happening in those kingdoms. When people justify what's happening in the kingdoms, it's because they're on the inside. When God separates a person, they do not speak up for anything. Inside those kingdoms, why not? Because God shows them the truth. And that's why. Hmm? Somebody says, Mike, why are only some seem to be called? That's because only very few respond. When God calls a person, right? Many, many are called. Some people are so embedded in the world. They will not hear the voice of the Lord. The Lord will always say, come out of her. He always says that. Come out of her. That's what people don't want to hear. When the Lord says, come out, they're trying to get in. They're trying to get their foot in the door. They aspire to be something inside the kingdoms, and so they will not listen to the Most High who says, come out. They won't listen. When the Lord says, come out, he says, come out all the way. You're dropping everything to go. Everybody's not going to do that. Many are called, few are chosen. Few are chosen because very few, very few agree to leave everything behind. When the Lord calls someone, they leave everything behind. Everything is left behind. And then the Lord sends them back to give warning to who? The very people. The controllers of faith. Every time a prophet came back, he warned the priests, didn't he? When a prophet came back, he warned the priests, didn't he? He did. He warned those who were in charge of those things of the Lord. That's who the prophet warned. That's who he warned. 
Lord have mercy. But see, people in this day and age, right, if God called them out of the world, period, it's too much to give up. Too much. How many could respond to that call in truth? Hmm? How many could God call out in truth? Somebody said Ezekiel was a priest. Well, look at Jeremiah. Look at look at David. Right? Look at these guys who had the lineage of God called them out of what they were. God called them out of that kingdom, period. What about the ones whom God called out and then they compromised with the kingdom? They messed up big time like King David. Like Solomon. They messed up big time. I mean, they messed up big time. Did God ever call anybody who was squeaky clean? No, he did not. He never called anybody who was squeaky clean. He always called people who had major issues. Did you notice? Moses had major issues, didn't he? Those who were called out to lead the people, they had major issues. David was a murdering, peeping Tom. I know people don't like to hear that, but that's what he was. He was a sex-crazed lunatic. That's what he was. That's what he was. God still called him, didn't he? Why did he call King David in the first place? Because with all David's faults, he was a man after God's own heart. But why was he a man after God's own heart? Who would send their buddy to battle so they can get their wife? Hmm? Who would sit there and peep at people? And daydream about him and then conspire these evil plans to get to him. Who would lie about big battles so they could position themselves to get the best of the best? King David did. So why was he a man after God's own heart? You can read his sayings. You know what David always said? You know what he always said? He never lied. He never, he never denied that he was all messed up. He did not. He would always say, Lord, I have engaged as you have required, and I depend upon you. The major thing David kept saying was, I depend upon you. He never said, he never said, I depend upon me. He never said, I depend upon them. He said, I depend upon you. I need you. I depend upon you, and without you, there is no me. So guess what? He truly had a dependence on the Most High. And he truly, he truly knew how to execute his heart of compassion over those things God gave him charge over. He messed up more than he helped. He was a man after God's own heart because he was full of repentance. And he depended upon the Most High. You know what happens to a person who's just terrible at everything? A lying, cheating, murdering somebody. But they depend upon the most high. They will not stay the same. They're going to end up being the most solid pillar for anybody. They will. Even I can never join with anybody who has no experience with who the devil is. Because I know the devil will cling to them to get to me in a heartbeat. No. You have to have experience with who what evil is. Look at all of whom God called. Look at what they were engaged with. Hmm? And all of them were dedicated. They really believed, which is amazing. They really, really believed, didn't they? Hmm? They really believed. That's why some of you were roughnecks. why you're so difficult you had to tangle with darkness you had to see what the true sentence of sin was you had to know that the wages of sin is death god when he sends a person he didn't send a person with a bunch of statements he does not he will send a person who knows what they're saying if somebody reads a book and then tells you what they read what is that anybody can do that but who can tell you 
how to navigate things. Who believes what they have read? Who has walked through what they have read? Real darkness is coming. That thing everybody's looking for in the sky, it's on its way. The evil constellation, it will avail itself. The changes in the moon, everybody will see that. And when they do, their whole world is going to be turned upside down. It's not going to be that neat, categorized place they thought it was. The barriers that are in the earth, above the earth, and through the earth, they'll all be removed. The spiritual barriers removed. The seas are going to give up what's in them. And when they come topside, no one will forget that day. All these stories of disclosure are leading up to the fallen being revealed. Remember, those things never died. They were just bound. But there were countless others who were not bound. They are in the earth. Many of them in the oceans right now. You're going to hear about commanders, ex-presidents, lots of operatives, people who are in charge of some pretty big things. They're going to tell you there are at least 700 bases in the oceans, and they do not belong to humanity. That's what you'll hear. Because all that's coming topside. All of it is. Reinstated kingdoms that have been living all this time, watching everything in humanity, forbidden to touch them because of God's decree. They can't cross a certain barrier, and neither can we. That barrier will be removed. And when it is, men will know what death is. Men will know what fear is. You'll really know what's been influencing them. It's not going to be fun times during that time. They will cause most of the earth to fall under some sort of submission. Someone says reptilians. Nope, not reptilians. There's no classification you can put on what they are. Some will look just like you and I, a bit bigger. No one will ever mistake them. And it will not be that awe-inspiring moment that most people are looking for. It'll be a time that nobody ever wanted to approach when the reality sets in that that time has come. That's when people will say, we had it so good and we messed it up. That's when many of God's people will repent for real. Look as hell now. Now, the major question, do I believe anything will happen this eclipse? No, I do not. I don't because too many people expect it. Every time people expect something on a big, big, big platform like they do now, nothing ever happens. God made a promise. He also has a way about him. And he has statements. And one of those statements is they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. And so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. They knew nothing until the flood came and took them all away. They didn't know a thing until the flood came and took them all away. He said they would be marrying, right? They'd be buying and selling, marrying, giving into marriage. They did so until the flood came and took them all away. So also the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, the coming of the Son of Man is also what? Hmm? The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the worst time that will ever be upon the face of the earth. And the world's not going to know when the day of the Lord comes. They're going to be living life as normal. They're going to be doing things normally on the earth until that day comes. The day of the Lord is the coming of Christ. So the coming of Christ is our deliverance. But the first day of woe for the world. Does that make sense to you now? Christ isn't coming back multiple times. He's coming back one time. But for us... For those who are alive in that day, not everybody who believes in Christ is going to be alive at that day. They're not. Not everybody here with us now, you may not be alive when the Lord comes. Those who are alive when the Lord comes, they'll go through that transition period. None of us are promised tomorrow. If I happen to go within a week, right, I will not be here when the Lord comes. How about that? I will have made it through great tribulation. At the last trump, the Lord is coming. And if you take note in the Bible before the great and terrible day of the Lord, right? Things are happening in the earth. 
lives are being taken in the earth. Things are being revealed in the earth. Armies are let loose upon the earth. This is before the great and terrible day of the Lord. This is before that time. Now, if no man knows the day nor the hour that Jesus is coming, and at the same time Jesus comes, right? Because the Bible tells us how he's coming. Every eye will see him, correct? He's coming with 10,000 of his saints, correct? Every eye is going to see him. Nobody's going to miss him. Then if no man knows that day nor hour, then nobody knows the day nor hour of the coming uh, at the uh, day of the Lord either. You see how that works? Isn't that one and the same? Yes, it is. Destruction for the world, deliverance for the believer. No one knows that day nor hour either. Then the, then the apostles say, don't be deceived. No one knows that day nor the hour. We know the season of his coming because he died on the cross. Do you not know the process began when he died on the cross? The process is not going to begin. It began when he died on the cross. When the Lord sat at the right hand of the Father, Satan was kicked out of heaven. He cannot accuse anymore where the sacrifice sits right beside the Father. He has no placement in the heavens anymore. I know that people are waiting and they're saying Satan is coming to the earth. Are you kidding? You telling me that Satan's influence is not in the earth right now? You're telling me that true darkness is not in the earth right now? See, men are making this mistake because they cannot see it with their natural eye. They say it's not come yet. That's a big mistake. That's almost saying the Holy Spirit is not here because they can't see it with the natural eye. Jesus addressed this in the book of uh, uh, John. He said the world does not have the truth because they can't see it. They'll never accept what they cannot see. We are not to walk by sight. We are to walk by faith, which is the truth of our Father's word. That truth is revealed to us by the Father. Remember when Jesus said, who do men say that I am? What did Peter say? He said, you're the Christ. What did the Lord say? He said, upon that rock I will build my church. What rock was he talking about? He said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven, and upon that rock, I'm going to build my church. So the rock is actually the revealing of Christ by the Father without the human eye. It's not some revealing by flesh and blood. There's no evidence. There's no proof. If flesh and blood reveals it, the church is not based upon that something tangible the church is based upon a revealing of the father that is not flesh and blood see that that's the rock that is the rock of which the church is built so by that same revelation by that same revelation identification of the components in the earth can be seen right now some people have been unfortunate enough to see the flesh and blood things. But it damages the mind to see such things. It does. It does something to the mind. Anybody who's ever seen authentically, ever seen anything in the sky, if they have authentically viewed that, it changes something within you. Anybody who has honestly seen something in the heavens like that, they know they have an understanding. It changes something within you. It does. It changes something within you. Those are the days coming. Somebody said, what is the next event? No, don't look for an event. Look for the crumbling. I told you we didn't make it through that 40-day period. If that 40-day period had been silent, Right? Everybody could have taken a breath, I do believe. We can't do that. We didn't make it through that 40-day period without interruption. There were forces acting upon the sun during that time. Had the sun resisted those forces within that 40-day period, we would have been fine, but it didn't. It crumbled. It was not silent. Too many things happened. At the 40th day, too many things happened. And I told you guys at the 40th day, I said, look for things to start happening back to back. Not because of, uh, you know, some 
yeah, uh, some download or something like that. No, this is this is because we did not make it through a specific type of pulse. You guys remember that I said things will escalate. Things will start to escalate from here. We're going to lose our magnetic shielding. It's about to go haywire. That's going to cause massive interruptions in the stability we've had on the earth. Don't count things out. That same 7.0 earthquake, right, could strike right in the middle of Utah. And then what? It could hit in a place where people have, have tried to protect themselves and said it was the best place to move to. Mexico is going to have big problems from that. They will. Lord help them, they will. That means it'll travel right there to the Gulf. That's plate shifting in Russia, which will bounce right back to Peru. And California is part of that plate shift also, which means more eruptions. We're going to have more eruptions. That's an ejection of stuff that we don't need in the atmosphere right now. The dust and the winds are coming. And I don't believe too many things are going to withstand the winds we're about to experience. The winds are going to be brutal. The dust is going to be worse. And until it happens... There are going to be too many, too many different stories out there causing people not to prepare for it. So when these things happen, we'll cover more. Unfortunately, I can't cover everything before things take place because it'll go through one ear and out the other. People will not remember. It won't be important. Remember that. 37 says, Samuel was squeaky clean, so was Daniel. Oh, Samuel made a, some big mistakes. Now, Daniel, Daniel was abandoned into a kingdom, put there to save a people in a kingdom, right? What did Daniel do, though? Daniel influenced the king directly. Prophets were sent for a different reason. If you look at the book of Daniel, Daniel had a very different calling, didn't he? Daniel was totally different. Daniel was more like a component to assist the king. So God took something to assist King Nebuchadnezzar, King Darius, in that kingdom at that time. No other prophet was used like Daniel. Because Daniel, although they call him a prophet, was more of a, you could say, a heavenly assistant, sold into that, you know, the very thing he was sold into. He kept God's people, him, him alone. He kept God's people as an appointed vessel. Samuel, he totally messed up. Samuel messed up so bad it wasn't even funny. He did. Poor fella. But he, he got impatient. He only did that once, and Saul got impatient, took it all the way. He did. When they're used for a king's assistant, when they're put inside of a kingdom, they're an element of the Most High. They're, they're a person used an element of the Most High. But prophets are different. A prophet comes from the people and sent back to give warning to the people, right? What did Daniel do? Daniel gave interpretation, and he interceded for his country. Prophets gave a warning, declarations of the living God to his own people. Every single prophet warned God's people. God didn't send a prophet to warn the people that wouldn't hear them. God sent a prophet because nobody was listening to the word of God in the first place. And he sent a prophet to warn the priesthood. Like the book of Malachi, opening sentence. Right? If you read the opening sentence, you find out who the book of Malachi is for and who can actually rob God. In order to rob God, you've got to receive on behalf of God. If you don't receive on behalf of God, how can you rob him? We should have learned that lesson with Ananias and Sapphira. Same thing. You guys worried about uh, P, the, the um, 
tail of the comet that's coming? In the tail, there could be some interactions, right? But that debris has to be of a certain size to actually have an impact and survive all the way to the surface of the Earth. We will entertain things breaking right through the atmosphere. It's called a meteor storm. A meteor storm is when things do not burn up in the atmosphere, but they make it all the way to the Earth. Listen. So I'll give you, I'll paint a picture. When the black meteor storm comes, and those objects crash into both the ocean and land masses, and coastal cities are on fire, that's the day we're going to understand that the heavens have been kept stable all this time. Right? Because it will come. We can't dodge that. The field of this thing is huge and we're heading right for it. The earth and the solar system is about to pass through it. That's what's actually happening. We're going to pass through it. Right? We're like a car. Nobody has a... The, the, the car has no brakes. It just keeps going forward in this up and down motion, in a sine wave motion, right? We're going right through it. Head first. It's coming and nobody can do anything about it. We just have to endure it. And it's a, uh, you're looking at something that's long. It's not going to happen one day and then no day after that. Nope. We're going to go through that type of debris for some years. It'll be years. It's going to take us some years to get through that whole debris field. Right? It's important to them to find the average size of what we're actually facing. A meteor storm is different than one object falling. A meteor storm is all over the Earth. Question, Brother Mike, the Lord knew who he wanted here for these times. Yes, you're sent every, listen, if you're here, you're sent here. You know that, don't you? Nobody just finds the way here. We're all sent. We're all sent. All of us sent. And we all are called. Few are chosen, as Jesus said. Many are called, few are chosen. Not everybody will respond to the calling. All of us are called or we wouldn't believe in Christ, right? To be chosen, well, that's a higher level of interaction, you could say. I'm called. I'm not necessarily chosen. I am called. To be chosen is of a higher, that, that's, a, that's a whole other status there, right? And I'll never put myself in that category. Never. Never do that. To be called, yes. Because it's impossible for anybody to believe in Christ if they're not called. How can anybody believe in Christ? According to the Bible, God puts the belief in us. So we would not believe in Jesus without, right, the Lord putting that measure of faith within us. See how that works? As far as being called, when people are called, they're called to do very specific things or are chosen for that calling. They do very specific things, right? And a person who is, who responds to that call, they know what they have to give up. They do. I just n will never put myself in that category. I respond to plenty of things from the Lord, right? But I will not put myself in a category. Not like that. Nope. Those are the ones, the, the, these men of old set the foundation for what we go through now. They do. To build upon a foundation, you have to know the dimensions of that foundation, everything about the foundation. You have a lot of people who are attempting to tear that foundation down these days. They love titles. They love importance. I refuse to be a part of that movement. Because it shouldn't be about mankind. Should it? It should be about God's word. And his way, and that true path to salvation, which is Christ, of which he determines, Christ will determine who belongs to him and who does not in the end.
Men will not determine that. Over time, men have empowered themselves. That's what has happened. That's what I can't help but to stand against. Man cannot name his own position in God's kingdom. Man can't do that. Only the Father can do that. Right? So I shy away from this empowerment of flesh, of people, of titles. And what did the Lord say about the smartest of us on this planet? The smartest of us is but foolishness to him. That's what he said. So we can be smart to one another. That does not make us smart at all. It doesn't make us smart at all. Just don't forget we're in the time of grace and mercy. You know what that means, grace and mercy? That means you don't earn your place. You don't. And that is part of the joy of Christ. You do not earn your place. Those who are undeserving can be given all. Those who are deserving can be in last place. That is Christ. It's not based upon this earning thing anymore. Right? In the Old Testament, you used to read of things, be careful to distinguish what God was telling a specific people based upon a condition and what he declared to everybody. There are several things in the word of God he spoke to his people. He said, if this happens, then he began to speak. And some people have used God's declarations, given a condition of the people, and they use that today. They can't do that. God was speaking that if they met a specific condition, a certain thing would happen. And some people, they, they preach that like that's what God is saying over all. No, he isn't. See, we have to rightly apply the word of truth, right? And when we read it in context, it comes to life. If it's taken out of context, you can turn it into many things it is not. Context is very important, right? We don't go out and stone people, do we? But the Lord did say, he told us to stone people, didn't he? He did, but that's not what we do, do we? No. We are called to a priesthood through Christ, all of us. And when's the last time somebody defined a priesthood of what that is according to Christ? What did Christ actually say? Somebody says, anything on those white trains? Yes. They're getting stacked up and ready to roll. That's a midnight hour conversation. Here's why. That is uh, spooky, and a lot of people can't handle that. You guys have heard about the eggs, right? And the chickens again, and the bird flu, right? You've heard about the monkey pox. They're trying to... Uh, desperately find how certain things are jumping to humanity right now. All of this surrounding this eclipse thing, right? All of it is. So, you know, have, they have to put down millions of chickens. But they found out that that came from the cows, and so now they have to put down hundreds of thousands of cows. They also said it's going to drive food prices straight through the roof. What's happening is something is happening to the product, right? Both the product that we eat and drink, the product that we wear, something is happening where it affects all of it. Every time they try this, something else happens, right? Bossy and DOD created it. Well, unfortunately not. This, this actually... Actually, back in the days of Vietnam, right, the same pathogen and the same set of, of things was picked up from people being deployed all over the place. International trade, if you guys look back in history, right, you're going to find back in history as far back as the 1800s, you're going to find most of these diseases were back then. That's what you'll find. When that story is put together, you find out international trade Right? And insects going all over the place, they became carriers of much. Which is why don't find, don't think it's strange in the USA. If you, if an insect is on you and you see it stamped with a number, don't think it's strange if you start seeing cicadas 
right? Like cicada, there's going to be a cicada hatch. Of course, they have little drones mixed in with the cicadas because that's how they guide. Um, that's how they, there was a, I'll give you guys an example. There were some locusts. They were about to do some damage here in the USA. So some smaller drones were put in among the locusts to guide them into other places. Now, I know if anybody picked that up, you know, anything nefarious you can dream of, somebody would put that out there. But these things really do exist, right? They really do exist. Uh, so don't be surprised if insects land on you and they have a numerical sequence on them. Or if they seem mechanical by nature or biomechanical, meaning they're chipped, they have chips on them, right? Guidance chips, which can influence the insect to go one direction or the other. Don't be surprised at that stuff. These are techniques that are being used to actually drive swarms away from crops because something is happening to our crops. Right? Something has happened. So there we are. Somebody says, Mike, how to rightly divide the word of truth without taking it out of context? Well, instead of reading the verse, read the whole chapter to understand the verse. Read the whole chapter to understand the verse. Right? If I had a dream and I told you guys, you know, I have $6 million. That's out of context. Here's the whole dream. I was dreaming, and in the dream I had $6 million, and then I woke up with nothing. Now, that's context, right? But if I just pull the middle part out, you get a total different meaning. Correct? You put something back in context, you find out what it was referring to and what it originated from. Biblical context is the same way. So read, instead of reading just the passage, as a lot of people love to do, read the whole chapter. And I found that when you read the whole chapter, it's going to lead you to read the whole book. And when you read the whole book, you're going to find context for all of what's in it. But there are so many things that people are used to using that have for a long time been out of context, right? And that could have come through a lack of education or something along those lines. But when you put it back in context, sometimes it's so drastically different from what most people have believed when it's put back in context it changes everything but nevertheless it is the truth and the lord warned us that in these last days that same thing would take place right he said that thing would take place strange doctrines would come forward right do we hear it you know, i hear it all the time now people take uh, scriptures out of context and all they have to do is read once before it and once after it to find out what it was actually talking about. But they use them for whatever they find convenient, unfortunately. Right? And that's what we're not supposed to do. Men want to be cushioned. People want to be cushioned. All they want to know is that everything is going to be all right. That's not what the Lord told us. The Lord said we're going to be delivered. But we're going to be delivered by his process. We're going to be raised by his process. Not with the cushions we desire in this life. And there are too many people who have had such a cushiony message that when a standard thing happens to them in the process, they get bent out of shape as though it's not supposed to happen. Right? You know, when when in, in the Bible, when it says, don't think it's strange when you go through fiery trials, that means we're going to have fiery trials. But when a fiery trial comes, people get upset like it's not supposed to be there. The word says the opposite. Right? It says the opposite. Somebody says, well, the World Health Organization have authority over the USA in May 2024. You know what? Name an occasion when the, when the uh, WHO did not have authority over the U.S. Uh, US medicine in the first place. In the last, what, since, it, since it's almost since its inception. Can anybody name a date? Where something did not go through the who? It's hard to name a date, isn't it? Because everything goes... Listen, in, in the world, when things operate, right? When they really do operate, most often you'll find things are already in place. Because they don't announce them. People believe they don't exist, right? If, for example, suppose... Um, some other person was talking in COT. That person talked to you guys for 25 years, right? But that's all you knew. You think that person was in charge, right? You wouldn't know that that person seeks authorization from somebody else every time they speak, right? Suppose that happened. The same thing is happening with the U.S. and other countries. 
They don't advertise the part of authority. They just give you the outcome of things. And then we draw upon what we can see. It's what you can't see, right, that really reveals the true mechanisms of things. It's what you cannot see. That's how things are really operating. If you trust what you see, you're going to buy the lie every single time. Before a war starts, why do they have to go to the Vatican? Hmm? Why? Why is the Vatican consulted before anybody goes to war? And if anybody goes to war and they do not consult the Vatican, the world just, just you know, says, no, you got to stop. Right? Remember the Ukraine? Remember the Pope went to Russia? Remember that? And they all met up and then all of a sudden Russia went right into the Ukraine. He did that to Crimea also. Did you take note of that? That happens all the time. So something is happening already. You know, you're in the middle of things already. It's just that it is not a popular narrative. It's not. They give you, you know, most people take the narrative based off things they can see. Same thing with Revelation. A lot of people interpret Revelation based off what they can see. You can't do that. You've got to remember the spiritual side of things and that we only know about maybe 5% of what the real reality really is. We don't know what reality is. We only know what we're exposed to. And if we base everything on what we're exposed to, then we're, we're interpreting the Bible by sight. We're doing the very thing God said don't do, right? It's fine to talk about things you can see, but don't determine the future based off only what you can see because the future has never turned out to be what people thought it was going to be. Hmm? It never happens that way. It never does that. That's what happens with that. So, remember that. Right? Is the sun actively causing heart problems? The sun is intimately tied to the processes of biology for most things on this earth. Most things on this earth. It's vibrations. It's resonance. Everything. Right? Um, it it, it, it uh, is very fine-tuned. Interaction between the earth, the other planets, and the sun. Uh, which gives, you know, offers life here that we can see, the life that we can see here. Do I believe this is it? Nope, I do not. I do not. Somebody says, I've been going, I've been seeking out Greek and Hebrew language. I'm not trying to question. No, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. And the more you understand, the better, right? Listen, if, if you go through Greek and Hebrew, Right. You get to learn what the original script was all about. And in so doing, you can go, you know, certain certain people come to conclusions based on the grapevine stuff. That, we live in a time of the Internet now. Right. So that means every source of a dictionary is not a sanctioned source. That's what it means. So they moved away from uh, sure resources and just about any and everybody is refining things. Right. Things change fast on the Internet. If you study those languages yourself, you're just going to empower yourself to remove barriers from your understanding, right? That's all. You'll just know that you know. It's just like in the Bible. Every single declaration in the Bible seems to be repeated at least two to three times. And that's an amazing thing to me, to see it repeated two to three times. When God required us to... to to have things confirmed in, you know, in our little realm two or three times <clears throat> by two or three witnesses. He did the same thing in the Bible. It's an amazing thing. And they did not, based upon how the Bible was compiled, they did not conspire to make sure uh, things were in there two to three times. They didn't do that. Right? So it just happened to be. So God authored that. If you study Greek and Hebrew, it, it, it just expands. It it'll adds assurance. To what you already know, it'll say the same thing, but then you'll have a concrete knowing of those things. You can also expand in certain areas, you know, different tiny little facts. That'll be gems uh, in your in your walk of faith. Will you miss anything by not knowing Greek and Hebrew? I don't think so. I think that all truth, right, comes by revelation. Regardless of what's printed, all truth comes by revelation. If God did not give you the truth, 
right? You wouldn't be able to read the Bible and say, yes, I agree. You wouldn't be able to say that. That's what amen is. Yes, I agree. You wouldn't be able to say that. The reason why you agree is because you have the truth already in you, which is why when you read the Bible, when you really read the Bible, it's not telling you anything new. It's just confirming what was already within you. Hmm? That's all. Somebody says, don't despair with trials. That's right. The Bible tells us what those, those trials, they were patience, right? They add to us faith, ultimately. Uh, they make us not ashamed of what we hope for in Christ. So they're working something in our lives, big time. Without trials, we would be as weak as thread, and we all know it. We all know it. Every trial that we go through adds strength. But who likes the process of growth? Nobody I know likes the process of growth because it hurts. It hurts. Right? The process of adding strength to anybody is to add extra weight. Which means you'll be right there where you're comfortable holding up one weight and then more weights are going to be added to that. Well, guess what? The body works like this. The more weight you have on you, the more muscle you're going to start growing to hold up those weights. And so that's what trials are. Without trials, we would fold at every single mishap. We would. We would fold at every single mishap. God did not make not one of us to fold up. Jesus said that out of his own mouth. We make ourselves fold up because we tried to dictate what our strength level is. And God already told us he knows what our strength level is. We don't. We discover what it is as we go through things. And what did he say? We discover more and more that we can handle more than what we thought we could handle. This is a discovery from us. God knows we discover. We start messing up when we say what we can't handle. Now, we can be honest. There are certain things we can't be involved with. But as far as your strength goes, God knows what we can handle. We don't. Right? We don't know. That has to be revealed to us. Folks, God bless each of you. I'm going to see you guys next time right here at COT. Before we continue to go on, it'll be midnight before I stop. We did that one time before. Remember that? We did. We did that one time before. I'm going to go ahead and uh, give you guys a break. Let's rest. I'm going to see you guys tomorrow right here at COT twice. We'll do that twice. 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 Right? We'll get back on schedule, too. Something is passing, just so you know that. Something is passing, and I'm hoping maybe it'll fully unleash. But we'll see, and it was not the earthquake. It's something else. We'll see. It, it's more of a policy than anything else. I just want to see if they're going to act on it. Because if they act on it, uh, we're going to go in a different, we're going to have to do something different just for about uh, two, three days. Something like that. Something like that. Somebody says, do, do comments with, well, listen, all comments with a tail, with that debris in it, there's a potential that debris can go right into the atmosphere and come straight to the surface of the earth, right? There's always that possibility. So, as far as we can go on that one, definitively, can I say something's going to penetrate the atmosphere? No. I don't look at situations like that. I don't. Listen, have this understanding, guys. When I when I start uttering out things that will, I believe that will most certainly happen to the earth. It's not those things. Let's say the things given to me, right? The things I'm really concerned about. So yes, I'll blurt them out. I'll be bold enough to blurt them out. But as far as every happening in the heavens, do I know about every happening in the heavens? No, I do not. I don't look for those things, really. I really don't. The Lord will point to me to several areas at one time, and, and it's enough to track those things. It really is. But I do not go searching out for certain things, okay? I don't do that. Animals are very significant throughout the Bible for a lot of things. Why do you think that when animals dies, it doesn't go to heaven? Nope. I said animals are part of creation. Animals are part of creation, right? God's kingdom, listen to me. God's kingdom, this plight of man is for man. Jesus died for humanity. He did not die for a goat, right? Why? Animals are obedient just like creation is. 
animals are obedient. Animals are being exactly what they're made to be. Right? Our plight took the intercession of the Creator. Okay? God's creation is not heaven part of God's creation? Yes. Is the earth part of God's creation? Yes. Do you see? Do you see that? If, if the earth is part of God's creation, and the heavens is God's creation, and the animals are part of God's creation, like the trees and the fish and the birds and everything else, right? Think about that. That's why I don't, a lot of people worry about animals and things of that nature. I do not. They're part of God's creation. See? So when we're talking about the heavens, we need not talk about trees and mosquitoes and spiders. All that's part of God's creation. All of it is. And God can utilize his creation how he wants. That's why. See that? So if an animal passes here on this earth and it, it, it showed a specific, you know, uh, disposition toward you, it liked you or something like that, how can you ever be absent? That spirit of that animal, it is part of God's creation. You yourselves will always be part of God's creation, right? Eternally. So how can you ever not have the same spirit that was in that animal or that same life force that took a took a you know that acted with you in a certain degree how can you be absent that you're not you're not that can manifest in anything right? not absent those things okay let's see where we're where we are kd files releasing yes part of the intro to the kd files is releasing yes so that you guys can get accustomed and acquainted uh, to part of it. Okay. Ooh, 37. That's a pretty good one. He locked on to it. Well, we'll see. I think 37 knows exactly what I'm looking for. We'll see. If it, if it takes place, we'll go in that direction. If it doesn't, we'll continue on. If it takes place, you know they plan on decimating an entire city. If it takes place. That means because last satellite images showed the direction, right? Uh, and then communications confirmed coordinates. So... If the azimuth is correct, that's for the decimation of a city. That is to overwhelm defenses and to decimate the entire city. So we'll see. If that happens, that's going to be global news and a global tragedy for quite some time. And everything changes at that point, as you can imagine. Matter of fact, if that happens, I think everybody will be on air. Can't count that out. We live in those times. But we'll see. Folks, God bless and keep all of you. Somebody said, was Damascus destroyed yet? Well, I'll tell you this. I would not live in Damascus. Damascus will be a ruinous heap. That's what it is, isn't it? Right? Even though you can have a person that lives in Damascus, it can still be a ruinous heap. Right? Damascus is a ruinous heap. It really is. A, a, a ruinous heap indeed. Well, folks, God bless each of you. I'll be standing by, just in case. Just in case. Today and tomorrow might be a pretty big day. Well, the rest of today and tomorrow, I'm probably... Uh, Maybe the next day we'll see. We'll see. For those of you who know what I'm talking about, it's this way about every every two days. There's always something just like this that takes place. Always something keeping people up at night. So, a salute to those who are in uniform who watch for such things. 
not the ones who cause them, but the ones who watch for them. Because it's very troublesome, big time, especially in the days we live in. It's very difficult to really find out who is allied to who these days. It's very difficult. God bless and keep you guys. I'll see you next time right here at COT. God bless.